Hello everyone, my name is Anthony Medock and I'm with the Department of Emergency Medicine and I'd like to welcome you to our UCSD Emergency Ultrasound Lecture Series. This presentation is going to be focused on the second part of our echocardiography lecture and we're going to specifically be looking at some various forms of pathology as well as several of the emergency medicine geared ultrasound applications when it comes to bedside echo. Here's a brief outline of what we're going to talk about over the next 30 minutes or so. We're going to look specifically at a few examples of some pathology as well as some various applications that you can use at the bedside with your new echocardiography skills. And after we do that, we're going to talk about uh, some pearls, pitfalls, and tips, and then wrap up with a few conclusions and closing thoughts so you can get out there and get started and start scanning. The first pathology we're going to talk about is looking at pericardial effusion. Now, normally the pericardial space will have a small amount of fluid and epicardial fat, but generally it's going to be something that is very hard to appreciate in the normal condition. This space, however, can of course fill with fluid, blood, or pus, and generally that's going to appear as an anechoic collection of fluid around the heart. Now, specifically when we talk about exudative effusions, pus, malignant, blood, or fibrin, containing effusions, there may be some echogenicity within the pericardial space, and it may not necessarily be purely anechoic or purely black. But again, in general, it'll be rather apparent, and in general, the appearance will be anechoic or black. There may be small amounts of echogenicity within it, depending on the inflammatory characteristics of the specific pericardial effusion. Now, why do we care about diagnosing pericardial effusion? Well, of course, because ultimately this can lead to hemodynamic consequences. Specifically, as excess fluid starts to fill in the pericardial space, this can impair right heart filling. Obviously, this can lead to hemodynamic consequences and can culminate in cardiac tamponade. Now, ultrasound, as you well know, is an excellent modality to assess for pericardial effusion. Ultrasound may also demonstrate tamponade physiology, oftentimes before it will be readily apparent based on bedside physical exam skills. And oftentimes, the subcostal approach is going to be your best bet when looking for pericardial effusion, as opposed to some of the other uh, echo views that we've discussed in the previous lecture. Okay, so let's take an example here. So on this side of the screen, you can see a normal subcostal view of the heart liver, right ventricle, right atrium, interventricular septum, left ventricle, left atrium. Contrast that with the view you get on the opposite side of the screen. I've highlighted in red the pericardial fluid, and as that fades away, you can get a pretty nice view. Again, a subcostal view, so you have liver, right ventricle, right atrium, interventricular septum, left ventricle, left atrium, but of course here you can see an anechoic fluid collection both anteriorly between the liver and the right ventricle as well as posterior here as well. So this anechoic fluid collection all the way around is a nice example of a pericardial effusion. Okay, when we describe these pericardial effusions, oftentimes cardiologists, for example, will characterize them based on the amount of posterior anechoic stripe. So in other words, how big is the anechoic stripe posteriorly? And these are some rough guidelines. So in general, if that is less than 5 millimeters, it's considered a small effusion. If it's between 5 and 20 millimeters, it's moderate, and it's considered large if it's greater than 20 millimeters. Now these are just rough guides, and by no means is this something that is meant to be very quantitative. So here's another example of pericardial effusion. Again, you can see the anechoic fluid collection both anteriorly and posteriorly, all the way around. And if we were going to measure it, we could measure that fluid collection here posteriorly. But in general, I don't find that terribly useful or clinically relevant. The main thing is, do you see evidence of tamponade physiology or not? In other words, are you imminently looking at having hemodynamic consequences from this fluid? or is it something you have time to work up? Here's another example. Now we're looking in a parasternal short axis view. So here we have the left ventricle at the level of, looks like, papillary muscle, 
we have some right ventricle here and then pericardial fluid pericardial fluid pericardial fluid all the way around pericardial fluid so we have a significant pericardial effusion all the way around that's pretty readily evident now in those previous couple of examples finding the pericardial fluid was not terribly challenging but sometimes it's not so easy and there can be circumstances where you may not be certain now pay particular attention to the area here that's highlighted by the arrow so this area you see right here now clearly we can see wall of ventricle and this is the pericardium so there's clearly something in that space is it fluid or is it not fluid this is an example of a common fake out epicardial fat in other words there's generally going to be a little bit of epicardial fat that can sometimes be visible particularly anteriorly and you may actually see something in that space however if you look closely it's not anechoic it's hypoechoic so it's a bit kind of gray it's not black in here per se and not only that if you look you can't really see it that well in this view but oftentimes if you look posteriorly you're generally not going to have epicardial fat there so you won't see much of a anechoic or hypoechoic signal posteriorly so if you generally see only a thin stripe of hypoechoic signal anteriorly but not posteriorly be wary that that might just be epicardial fat and could be a fake out okay now here's another example this is a still not a video but I'd like you to pay particular attention to the fact that you can see an anechoic fluid collection right here now in this particular view in the parasternal long axis view um, you can see left atrium left ventricle outflow tract and some of the right ventricle here the other thing I'd like you to pay particular attention to is this here this is the descending aorta so if you can identify the descending aorta you know that the cardiac chamber adjacent to it in the parasternal long or even in the apical four chamber view is going to be the left atrium and that's very important because if you see a fluid collection that is tracking along adjacent to the left ventricle that can be used as a landmark to help differentiate what you're looking at this is an example of pericardial effusion as we talked about anechoic fluid collection that you can see posteriorly but in particular you can see how this fluid is tracking and it's dissecting between the descending aorta and the left atrium so it's coming along anterior to the descending aorta contrast this example with this example here we have another parasternal long axis view left atrium left ventricle aortic outflow right ventricle here this is descending aorta just like in the previous example and here we have a large anechoic fluid collection however this time around it is not dissecting between the left atrium and the descending aorta but rather it is tracking along and coming here posterior to the descending aorta and in that circumstance what you're looking at is actually a pleural effusion not a pericardial effusion so please remember that if you're in the parasternal long axis view and you see a fluid collection tracking along posteriorly pay particular attention to where it is tracking if it tracks and moves along anterior to the descending aorta then that is a pericardial effusion if the fluid tracks and dissects along posterior to the descending aorta that is a pleural effusion not a pericardial effusion okay so now we spent a few minutes talking about how to assess fluid around the heart how to differentiate pericardial effusion from pleural effusion from epicardial fat and now we want to talk a little bit about what are some of the consequences of that fluid let's talk for a little bit about cardiac tamponade so just remember this that large oftentimes chronic pericardial effusions may be well tolerated for long periods of time however small acute effusions may be very poorly tolerated in other words tamponade is not so much dependent upon the amount of fluid within the pericardial sac but on the rate of fluid accumulation and on the pressure within the sac so it's not so much an issue of the size of the pericardial effusion that may necessarily cause tamponade but the rate of accumulation in other words you might have a patient that has a malignant pericardial effusion that could literally be close to seven eight hundred milliliters or more and they could be hemodynamically stable whereas in an acute trauma patient someone might have a hundred milliliters of fluid of blood in the pericardial space and they may be very hemodynamically unstable again because that accumulated very rapidly and their pressure within the sac is much greater even though the volume may not be terribly much in the acute setting okay so you may wonder 
Why do we need to use ultrasound to diagnose tamponade? It's pretty obvious, right? Isn't it pretty clear on physical exam when someone has tamponade? Not so much. We learned in medical school about something called Beck's triad, which is a combination of findings that includes hypotension, distended neck veins, and distant heart sounds. The problem is it's only found in less than 30% of cardiac tamponade patients, so obviously the sensitivity ain't so great. The other thing you can do is assess pulses paradoxus. And for those of you that uh, don't recall, that is specifically a greater than 10 millimeter of mercury variation in systolic blood pressure with respiration. The problem with this is it's not terribly specific. You can see pulses paradoxus with many other uh, conditions, not just cardiac tamponade. It can be seen in the setting of asthma, COPD. It can be seen in the setting of pulmonary embolism, hypovolemic shock, etc. So again, physical exam alone is not something you'll be able to confidently diagnose tamponade, and ultrasound is something that you could use as an adjunct and a tool to help you make the diagnosis sooner. So when we talk about tamponade, the clinical definition is essentially the presence of pericardial effusion that's causing circulatory collapse. So it's not just the presence of fluid, it's whether or not that fluid is causing any hemodynamic compromise. Now, echocardiographic tamponade accompanies clinical tamponade, but may, in fact, often will precede it. So when we talk about the echo findings of tamponade, they include the following. Number one, of course, you need to have a, significant, a clinically significant pericardial effusion. Then the things you want to look for are right atrial systolic collapse, right ventricular diastolic collapse. Another very important finding is a lack of respiratory variation in the inferior vena cava and the hepatic veins. And lastly, another thing you can look for is bowing of the interventricular septum into the left ventricle, which clearly is not the normal condition. Okay, now let's just use this nice illustration to illustrate some of the different things you can find on ultrasound in the setting of what we call tamponade physiology. In other words, subtle echocardiographic findings that are going to precede the clinical findings that make you worry about tamponade. So here you can see the pericardium and it is filled with fluid. So this is our pericardial effusion. This is during cardiac systole and this diagram is during cardiac diastole. Okay, so during ventricular systole, as the atria are filling and the right atrium is at its lowest pressure state, that is the time when you're most likely to see right atrial collapse if this pericardial fluid is exerting sufficient pressure to impair right atrial filling you're going to see a bowing or a collapse of the right atrium when the right ventricle is in systole. So in other words during ventricular systole as the right atrium is filling its pressures are relatively low and if the pericardial pressure from the fluid collection is greater than the filling pressure of the right atrium, then you'll actually see some collapse and bowing there. Similarly, during diastole, when the ventricle is filling and the right ventricle is at its lowest pressure, if the pericardial fluid is exerting sufficient pressure such that it's greater than the pressure within the ventricle during diastole, it will also cause a bowing type of defect on the right ventricle during ventricular diastole. Lastly, the other thing you may see is paradoxic septal motion. In other words, as these pressures start to increase because of the increased added pressure from the pericardial fluid, you may actually see paradoxical movement of the interventricular septum from the right heart into the left heart, which of course should never be the case in the normal condition. Okay, so here's a nice example. This is a subxiphoid view. You can see liver here in the near field. Here is the pericardium. You can see that hyperechoic line right there. Here we can see an anechoic fluid collection. And if you look closely at that right ventricle, you can actually see some bowing or collapse right there. Right there. So just focus your eye on that right ventricular free wall. And through a few cardiac cycles, you can almost see kind of an undulation or kind of a collapse of that right ventricle. So that is indicative of tamponade physiology. And this patient may be totally hemodynamically stable, but if you see this, you know that time is precious and you're going to need to act quickly to drain that fluid. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about pericardial effusion, how you can differentiate that from pleural effusion or epicardial fat, and also how you can look for early findings of tamponade physiology. 
Now let's talk about another application of your new echocardiographic skills and that is making assessments of left ventricular systolic function. This is something that can be very clinically useful in the emergency department when you're providing care for your patients. Now just to make sure we're all on the same page, when we, I want to make sure that we're clear on the term ejection fraction. This is simply the percentage of blood ejected from the ventricle during each systole. Of course, there are both quantitative and qualitative methods to assess the ejection fraction, but as non-cardiologists doing this exam, we are not going to spend the time, or oftentimes even have the software capabilities in our machines to make the rather detailed quantitative assessments of assessing ejection fraction. So again, as non-cardiologists, we are going to spend our time making these assessments on a qualitative basis. Okay, so when we're talking about these qualitative assessments, we're not talking about exact numbers here. Again, we're talking qualitative assessment. So when I do this, I essentially just look at the heart, make my assessment, and try to put the patient into one of three broad categories. In other words, do I think that the cardiac function is grossly normal and that the EF is approximately 50% or more? Do I think that the left ventricular function is moderately depressed on the order of EF 30 to 50% or so? Or is the function severely depressed on the order of 30% or less? So essentially, you're just trying to put the patient into one of three broad categories. Grossly normal, moderately depressed, or severely depressed. And that's really what we're going for here because that's sufficient to make clinical decisions in the emergency department. With proper training, emergency physicians can be quite good at this, and there's literature to support that. So how do you actually do it? Let's talk about it. So to qualitatively assess ejection fraction, you want to do the following. The first thing you want to do is you want to look for symmetric and robust movement of the endocardium. So I've highlighted that here in red. So you want to just pay particular attention. This is a parasternal long axis view. So here's left atrium. Here's mitral valve. This is left ventricle. This is left ventricular outflow tract, and here is some of the right ventricle here. So to qualitatively estimate EF, look for symmetric and robust movement of this endocardium, this innermost layer of the myocardium. The other thing you want to do is you want to assess excursion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet in the parasternal long axis view. So again, here's the left atrium. This is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This down here is a posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is left ventricle. This is outflow tract. So I want you to pay particular attention to look at that anterior mitral valve leaflet. All right, so now that we've got the video going again, you want to ask yourself, OK, look at the endocardium. Do I see thickening with each systole? Do I see nice, robust contractility all the way around? I would say yes. The other thing you want to do is you want to look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet. And during ventricular diastole, as the ventricle is filling, does this anterior mitral valve leaflet open up and come such that it nearly is touching the interventricular septum here? If the answer is yes, I see good contractility and squeeze looking at the endocardium. I see nice thickening with each systole. And looking at this anterior mitral valve leaflet, if during diastole it's coming up and swinging and almost touching, coming very near the interventricular septum, if the answer is yes and yes, then you qualitatively have good systolic function. Ideally, you want to make this assessment in two planes. So you could look, do a parasternal long axis asse assessment as well as a parasternal short axis assessment. All right, so let's do it together. Let's take a look. So you're looking at this view here. We have a parasternal long axis view. Here we have an apical four chamber view. So again, just remember those two things. Number one, let's look at the endocardium. Do we see nice thickening and robust contractility all the way around? Looks like we do. Look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet. Does it come up and nearly touch the septum with each cardiac cycle? It does. So this looks good. Now, same heart, different view. We look at, say, take an apical four chamber view. Um, this is the left atrium, left ventricle. This is the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And again, during each diastole, when this valve is opening up, you can see it's coming up and almost touching. In fact, it is touching, touching, touching right there. So if you pay attention to that anterior mitral valve leaflet, you can see it's coming up and touching the interventricular septum during each diastole. So that looks good. So I would put this in the normal category. Now, contrast this exam 
with this exam. All right, basically same two views. This is a parasternal long axis view, left atrium, a rather large left atrium, but left atrium nonetheless, mitral valve, left ventricle, outflow tract, and this is the right ventricular outflow tract. So remember what we said before, look at the septal wall, look at this portion of the left ventricle, and do you see good squeeze and thickening all the way around? Well, you see some contractility here, but it's very hypokinetic here. I don't see any thickening with systole at all. So this is a problem. I'm suspicious of this. And remember, the other thing we're supposed to do is look at the anterior mitral valve leaflet. We look at this, and during ventricular diastole, when it's filling, this anterior mitral valve leaflet should be coming up and practically touching the septum right here. And it's not. It's not coming anywhere close. So this is very concerning for abnormal systolic function. Let's take a look at the same heart, different perspective. So this is a slightly off-axis apical four-chamber view. So here's our left atrium. Here's our left ventricle. This happens to be the aortic outflow tract, by the way. Here's our interventricular septum, and then this is the right ventricle. Now, if we look at the left ventricular wall here and here, I can barely see it's hypokinetic everywhere. It looks even worse than in the previous view. And if I look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet, as opposed to in the previous view when it was coming up and pretty much touching the interventricular septum, this anterior mitral valve leaflet is barely moving at all. So this is a, an example, a very striking example, of abnormal systolic function, definitely in the severely depressed category, so certainly on the order of 30% or less, probably less. Okay, so what else can you do with these echo skills that you have when you're in the emergency department? Well, it can also be used in the setting of cardiac arrest. In cardiac arrest situations, ultrasound can be very valuable in assessing the need for further intervention. Um, there are several smaller studies that support the concept of terminating resuscitation if there's no organized cardiac activity on bedside ultrasound. And in fact, again, in some small studies, cardiac standstill is 100% predictive of death. So therefore, if you're in a situation where you're going through your ACLS algorithms, you're doing everything you can think of, you haven't re obtained ROSC, you throw the ultrasound probe on there and you see no organized cardiac activity, you probably are on pretty good ground to consider terminating resuscitative efforts if you can't come up with any other meaningful procedures or interventions to perform at that time. All right, so here we have an example. So let's just say you have a patient that gets brought in by EMS, CPR in progress, don't have too much history or ancillary information available, but you're doing your resuscitation, you've secured the airway, you've got IV access, you're kind of going down your ACLS algorithms, and during your first pulse check, you throw the probe on the chest, you get a quick subcostal view. Here is liver. Here's right heart, so right ventricle, right atrium. Here's some LV as well. A um, little bit of fluid here, not clinically significant, but certainly something to keep an eye on. Pericardium here looks otherwise pretty normal. So you take a look and you ask yourself, all right, do I see any organized activity? And I would say you do. You can see the right atrium and right ventricle and left ventricle doing a little something. So this is someone where the heart looks like it's still trying to have some organized activity. So I would keep pressing forward and see if you can have some success with ROSC. Now, bedside ultrasound is helpful in the evaluation of causes of PEA, for example. So you can do your exam and you can look for evidence of tamponade. And also, if you find tamponade, you can use the ultrasound to, to perform an ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis. You can use the ultrasound to evaluate for hypovolemia. You can look for pneumothorax. You can look for RV strain in the setting of PE. So some of the things that may actually be causing your patient to be unstable you can also diagnose with the bedside ultrasound. So not only is it helpful for your patients that are um, critically ill, for the patients that have no pulses, or for those that are in danger of losing pulses, you can also evaluate for the causes of those things and intervene. For example, in the setting of finding a large pericardial effusion, you can use your ultrasound and perform an ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis. Okay, so one of the other very important uh, applications of bedside echo in the emergency department is doing an intravascular volume status. And we're going to talk about how you do that now. So consider this. Central venous pressure and right atrial pressure can be estimated by evaluation of the IVC during respiration. In general, you're going to want to use the phased array or the curvilinear transducer. You're going to place the patient supine and you're going to place the probe in the long axis just beneath the xiphoid a little bit to the right of the patient's midline. 
Okay, this is going to be proposition. So in this case, we're using the phased array transducer in that sub xiphoid space. And you notice it's very important to angle the probe slightly cephalad and be to the right of midline. That way you're aiming your um, sound beam through the liver and into the chest, as opposed to if you have the transducer aiming straight down, you're going to be looking into the peritoneum. But remember, you want to look into the chest. So you want to angle a little bit cephalad. That way you can see a long axis view of the inferior vena cava reaching into the right atrium. So here's a netter plate. So here, imagine we're placing the transducer on the chest in that sub xiphoid space, and our beam is going to be shooting right through the liver so we can get it in there and get as just a, a parasagittal view, a long axis view of the inferior vena cava. Now, normally the IVC is going to be on the order of one and a half to two and a half centimeters, and the segment adjacent to the right atrium should collapse by roughly 50% with respiration. In other words, when they inspire, you should see a inspiratory collapse of the IVC of about 50%. Now, another way you can accentuate this is you can ask the patient to sniff, and when they do that, the IVC diameter should decrease and collapse. In other words, you can just ask the patient to go <laughs> like that, and as they do that, it'll be readily apparent on the ultrasound when you're looking at the inferior vena cava. Now, I do not emphasize, do not expect anybody to commit this to memory or think that this is some type of perfect science or quantitative uh, assessment. In general, looking at the IVC is going to be a qualitative assessment. But in order to qualitatively assess if an IVC is big, small, or somewhere in between, you have to have some idea of what normals are. So when we're thinking of the IVC diameter of small, if with respiratory um, variation or with sniffing the IVC collapses completely, then you would estimate that central venous pressure is going to be on the low side. What's the exact number? Is it going to be five or six or seven? Doesn't matter. It's going to be low. So that's someone that you suspect is going to respond positively in terms of hemodynamics with an IV fluid bolus. If the IVC diameter is grossly normal, somewhere on the order of two centimeters or so, and with inspiratory um, uh, changes of IVC, it collapses by approximately 50%, but not completely collapses, then the CVP is grossly in the normal range, likely. And if the IVC looks very large, if it's three plus centimeters, and as the patient's breathing or sniffing, there's very little change, then that would be someone that you suspect has a high CVP and not someone that would benefit from additional IV fluids. So essentially, small IVC that completely collapses the patient has likely a low CVP and would very likely benefit from IV fluids. If the IVC is large and has very little respiratory change, then their CVP is likely high and they are probably not going to benefit much from additional IV fluids. And that's where this exam is the most helpful. It's in the extremes. So in other words, if the IVC is small and completely collapsible, give that person fluids. If the IVC is large and is very plethoric, in other words, it doesn't change much when the patient's breathing, then don't give them fluids. This middle category, it's kind of hard to say if they're going to benefit from fluids or not, so you're going to have to use your clinical judgment. But in the extremes, small collapsing IVC, large plethoric IVC, it can give you a lot of helpful information. So now let's look at some examples. This is a normal exam. So by way of orientation, because this is a view we haven't talked about before, we're again placing the probe in the sub xiphoid space, just inferior to that xiphoid angling a little bit cephalad, rocking a little bit cephalad so we can look into the chest. All right, here's your orientation marker. This is where we're placing the probe on the anterior chest wall. So the top of the screen is anterior, the bottom of the screen is posterior. The marker dot is pointing towards the patient's head. So this side of the screen is towards the head. This side of the screen is towards the feet. This top portion here, then the near field, this is all liver. This is inferior vena cava in the long axis view. This is the right atrium. So let's take a look. So you can see right atrium here, you can see liver, you can see vena cava, and you can even see a little bit of hepatic vein right here, draining right into vena cava. And as this person is inspiring, you can see collapse there of greater than 50%, but you're seeing nice respiratory variation. So this is someone that I would categorize falling in the normal category. So without the labels, you can see again, hepatic vein going into vena cava, and it's very important to note that this structure here is clearly not the aorta because it's going and is contiguous with the right atrium right here. And you want to pay particular attention to this section of the inferior vena cava, and you can see as this patient is inspiring that it essentially completely collapses, but the caliber is nice and normal. 
So this is probably on the order of a centimeter, centimeter and a half. So this is someone that would be in the grossly normal range. Now contrast that with this situation. This is the exact same perspective, the exact same view. So anterior, posterior, towards the head and towards the feet. When I start playing the clip, you're gonna see some right atrium here. Now this time you're gonna have a lot harder time seeing the inferior vena cava because it's very, very small caliber and completely collapsing because this is a setting of someone that likely is hypovolemic. So take a look. So this is IVC that's nearly completely collapsed right here. This is right atrium, IVC, and the liver right here. Now without the labels, take a look. There you are. So inferior vena cava that you can barely see because it's completely collapsing. This is some right atrium. This is liver here in the near field. But again, you can barely see the inferior vena cava because it's collapsing on itself. But you can see that <clears throat> this tiny little lumen is indeed draining into the right atrium right here. So this is an example of pretty significant hypovolemia. So this is someone that would clearly benefit from some IV fluids. Now let's take the opposite example. Same view. Anterior, posterior, towards the head, towards the feet, liver in the near field. And then here we see a very large plethoric IVC. Plethoric simply means basically large without much respiratory variation. This is right atrium. You can see the vena cava draining right into the right atrium. And if we look at it here, without the labels, you can see the vena cava draining right into the right atrium. And not only is it large caliber, but as the patient's breathing, there is essentially no respiratory variation. So this is what we would call a plethoric IVC. And this would be consistent with a high CVP state. This is not someone that would likely benefit from additional IV fluids at this point. All right, so in closing, let's talk about some pearls, pitfalls, and tips. Remember that as you're trying to get good with this uh, modality here of bedside echo, don't try to overcall your findings or attempt to diagnose conditions that are beyond your level of training. We're not trying to get you into trying to assess for mitral regurgitation, looking for vegetations on valves, or looking for segmental wall motion abnormalities. We just want you to get the gist of what's the global systolic function of the heart, is there a pericardial effusion? Is there evidence of right ventricular strain? Those are some of the big questions we want you to assess when you are doing these exams in the department. Remember that epicardial fat is sometimes mistaken for pericardial effusion, so be mindful of that so you're not faked out. Be sure that from the get-go you have the machine in the cardiac setting. That way you get improved image quality because the internal um, parameters of the machine will be optimized for doing cardiac imaging. And lastly, don't mistake the aorta for the inferior vena cava. It sounds silly, but when you're doing that IVC view, it is something that can be um, done accidentally from time to time. So you want to make sure that you rock the probe cephalat upwards towards the head so you can aim your sound beam into the chest. And you want to make sure that you place the probe just to the right of the patient's midline so that you don't inadvertently take a long axis view of the aorta and mistake that for the inferior vena cava. So in closing, just remember that finding pathology on bedside echo is uh, one of the more subtle and complex applications of bedside ultrasound, but personally I find it's one of the most gratifying and one of the most clinically useful. So it's definitely worth the effort of trying to learn this technique. The literature supports that emergency physicians and other non-cardiologists with proper training can be quite good with this particular modality. And it's very important, remember, to get comfortable with more than one view. Get good at the subcostal view. Get good at the parasternal long and the apical four view because, as we mentioned in the previous lecture, no one patient is going to have great windows for all of them. So if you're good with all of those different views, no matter what your patient looks like, how big they are, how skinny they are, etc., you'll be able to get the information you need if you're comfortable with more than one of the traditional cardiac views. And just remember that even though in the beginning it may be challenging, the more you practice, the better you're going to get, and you'll be able to translate that to better patient care, which is, of course, what it's all about. These are some of the references used for this presentation. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me via email as well as via Twitter. And um, with that, I'd like to say thanks, and I look forward to working with you all in the department so we can get out there and scan. Thanks, take care.